Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dick. It's a beautiful, beautiful day, a little warm, but still beautiful. Our, um, our first song that we're playing, the title of the song is Over My Head. And what it brought to my mind uh, really was not in the song at all, but it just made me realize what, what is over my head. And one of the things that I do a lot when I'm trying to figure out a song that we haven't played for a while is I'll pull it up on YouTube and play it on YouTube so I can remember what the song sounds like. The one song that I was trying to find, the only thing that I could find were these huge choirs uh, like like New York Tabernacle Choir or Mormon Tabernacle Choir, where there's just so many choir members singing in a, a large, large hall. And, and it made me think that what is over our head when, when, what is over our head? Well, the angels are overhead, God's angels. There's a passage in the Bible that says every, angel rejoices whenever there's a soul saved. So if you can possibly imagine all of these angels singing a song and they're singing it over us, it's just, it's almost beyond comprehension what that would sound like. So as you go through your day and you go through your week and you stop and you glance up or you look at the sky to see if there's clouds or if it's going to rain, you see some gray clouds forming. Just think of what is actually up there that we don't see. All of those angels over our heads singing. <laughs> Over my head, 
Nelson's title of his message today is God of Deliverance. The Bible's full of God of examples of God's deliverance from Genesis through Revelation. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, time and time again, God provides deliverance to his people through protection from or victory over an enemy, but also through healing, providing, sustaining, and redeeming. <clears throat> I just started to write down uh, some people that God had provided deliverance for. I started Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and this was just Genesis that I got through. And I'm sure there's, there's more. I know there's more after I thought about it longer. There's more in there uh, that God provided deliverance for. The ark is a symbol of deliverance from judgment. The only unsinkable ship ever built was Noah's ark. This was actually one of three arks mentioned in the Bible. There's also the Ark of Moses, which carried the baby Moses from Pharaoh's judgment. The third is the Ark of the Covenant, with its blood-sprinkled mercy seat. All three speak of God's provision for deliverance. We've also heard stories uh, like that of Corey Ten Boom, who was delivered from the Nazi concentration camp, and other similar stories. The story of John Payton, a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands. I'm not sure exactly where that is. He was surrounded one night by hostile natives who were intent on burning out the Paytons and killing them. 
Peyton and his wife prayed during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see their attackers leave. A year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ. Remembering what had happened, Peyton asked the chief, what had kept him from burning down the house and killing them? The chief replied in surprise, who were all those men with you there? Peyton knew no men were present, but the, but the chief said he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men with drawn swords circling the mission station. God does provide or provide deliverance. David was one who experienced God's deliverance many times. I'm going to read a passage from Psalm 18. This is David speaking. The ropes of death entangled me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry to him reached his ears. I'm not a good dramatic reader, but close your eyes and read and listen to God's response. Then the earth quaked and trembled. The foundations of the mountains shook. They quaked because of his anger. Smoke poured from his nostrils. Fierce flames leaped from his mouth. Glowing coals blazed forth from him. He opened the heavens and came down. Dark storm clouds were beneath his feet. Mounted on a mighty angelic being, he flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He shrouded himself in darkness, veiling his approach with dark rain clouds. Thick clouds shielded the brightness around him and rained down hail and burning coals. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded amid the hail and burning coals. He shot his arrows and scattered his enemies. Great bolts of lightning, lightning, lightning flashed, and they were confused. Then at your command, O Lord, at the blast of your breath, the bottom of the sea could be seen, and the foundations of the earth were laid bare. Then I just wrote in my Bible, this is who I want on my side. Then David continues. He reached down from heaven and rescued me. He drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. They attacked me at a moment when I was in distress, but the Lord supported me. He led me to a place of safety. He rescued me because he delights in me. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being that all-powerful God who brings deliverance to each one of us in our time of need. Lord, thank you that sometimes, most of the times, in spite of ourselves, you delight in us. Lord, I ask that you be with us throughout this service. May your name be honored and glorified throughout. I pray you would bless Nelson as he brings his message. Give him the words to speak. I ask this all in your name. Amen. Worship team. My soul cries out. You fix 
cast your sight on your servant's plight, and my will is you did not spare. So from these two words shall my name be blessed, but the world be about to turn. My heart shall see on the day you bring that the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though I am small, my God, my old, you work great things in me. And your mercy will last from the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame and to those who before you yearn. You will show your might with the strong to fight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. From the halls of power to the fortress tower, not a stone will be left on stone. Let the king beware, for your justice tears every time riven from his throne. This next song is kind of a special song. Um, the, one of the reasons that we did it was for a, a very special person. And uh, it was because they were really going through some difficult struggles. Uh, these days with the pandemic that's going on and all the restrictions that are happening, uh, there's a lot of people who are really hurting and are just in a depression uh, that a lot of people just have never seen anything like this before. Uh, this song is basically a song telling us that we need to put our trust in, in Jesus uh, when he calls us to step out of that boat that's in the storm where we're just deathly afraid that we're going to die, you know, that the, the boat is going to sink and we'll be at the bottom of the ocean. Jesus is calling us to come out of the boat and step on the water and come to him. And that's just something that we really need to remember to do that, we have to teach ourselves to do that. We have to wake up in the morning and hear Jesus' voice calling us and saying, follow me, get out of the boat, put your feet upon the water, keep your eyes on me, and I will get you through the day. And that's the song, Oceans, Where Feet May Fail. Yeah. 
out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never failed and you won't start now. So I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine.
Yeah, I get to read to my own children. It's like a normal day. Okay, you guys gonna sit down or you wanna stand up? I'll stand up. Okay, today we are reading Joe and the Not So Little Lie. Ready? This is a new one for my kids too, so maybe they'll pay attention. Blink. One morning, Joe woke up and looked at the bright sun. What a wonderful day. Joe started walking to meet his friends at the big rock. Okay, go sit down. Careful. Joe saw something gold and shiny on the grass. What's this, he wondered. Did Rufus forget his horn? Joe picked up Rufus's horn and began to march. He tooted it high and low, just like Rufus. He blew loud sounds and soft sounds. Is this picture coming? But then Joe dropped the horn and clang, it fell on a rock. It's only a little dent, Joe thought. Rufus will never know. Joe walked quickly toward the field. Weren't even looking that time. <laughs> Up ahead, he saw rows of yellow flowers. What's this, he wondered. This must be Hal's garden. Joe started prancing through the flowers. He walked in circles and loops. He ran in zigs and zags. Then Joe looked back, and his smile turned into a frown. There was a trail of broken leaves and flower petals behind him. It's only a little mess, Joe thought. Hal will, Hal will never know. Joe started walking quickly towards the berry bushes. Towards the berry bushes, right? Joe saw some bushes up ahead. A basket of berries was on the ground. What's this, he wondered. Ava picked the, all the biggest, juiciest berries. You pick pretty good berries too, don't you? Yep. He reached into the basket to taste a few delicious. He started shoveling berries into his mouth. That kind of sounds like you too. He gobbled up more and more. And Lucas, right? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Joe looked down into the basket. He'd eaten almost all the berries Ava picked. Just then he heard Rufus howling and blowing his horn. What do you think is going to happen, Chloe? He's going to be in trouble? Let's see. Joe, Rufus called. My horn has a dent. How did that happen? I don't know. Maybe Hal dropped your horn, said Joe. Is that the truth, Chloe? No, it's not the truth. Hal came running to find Joe and Rufus. My flowers, my plants, they are ruined. Who did this? I don't know. Maybe Ava stomped through your field, said Joe. Is that the truth? Mm -hmm. We would have a lot of people in this church upset if someone ruined their plants and flowers, right? And gardens. Mm -hmm. Bah! Joe heard Ava crying as she ran to them. Someone ate the berries I was picking all morning. Where did they go? I don't know. Maybe Rufus found your basket. What did he do again? Lied. Lied again. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Do you think he's going to tell the truth? No? You think so? The friends all looked at Joe. Joe, did you do this, they asked. Joe looked down at the ground. I, your horn, the field, so many berries. Let's see what happens. 
Joe shut his eyes. He knew his friends were angry. He knew he wasn't telling them the truth. Maybe a prayer would help. Dear God, I told a lie and then another and another. Now my friends are angry. Help me tell them the truth so I can make things better. Amen. You're kind of right, Chloe. Oops. Joe opened his eyes and faced Rufus. I jumped, I dropped your horn on a rock. That's why it's dented. He turned to Hal. I stepped on your flowers and plants, Hal. Finally, he looked at Ava. I ate all those berries without asking you first. Joe faced all three of them. His voice sounded small and quivery. I am sorry I did those things, and I am sorry I told you lies about what I did. Will you forgive me? Do you think they'll forgive him? Yeah. Let's see. Rufus looked at Joe. If you want to play with my horn, ask me. I forgive you. Hal pointed to the field. I know you like to play there. Just watch out for my flowers. I forgive you. Ava held up her basket. I can pick extra berries for you next time. I forgive you. Joe looked at his friends and breathed a deep breath. He felt a lot better. Did you feel better too? Yeah. The friends started to walk to the big rock, but Joe stopped them. He reached out to Rufus. I can use my horns to tap out that dent, my hooves, sorry, to tap out that dent in your horn. Then I want to go to the field. Maybe I can help replant some flowers, he said to Hal. Ava, give me your basket. I'll go to the berry bushes to pick more. Maybe Joe wouldn't get to play at the big rock that day, but it was still a good day. That's it? Is that a good book? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Thank you, Mindy. For scripture reading, Nelson had asked to read Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 22. Exodus 13, 17 to 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through, through the Philistine country, though it was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham, on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. The Lord's blessings to you, Nelson. In this day and age when we're experiencing trials and tribulations is probably the biblical term. I love the line that Roland, I mean, that Nick used earlier, God rescues us because he delights in us. I guess it was Roland it was in the scripture. God rescues us because he delights in us. So what we're experiencing now, we can trust that God is going to rescue us. Because we aren't the first ones to go through hardships. You hear that? We aren't the first ones to go through hardships. The God of the Bible 
is a God of deliverance. The stories of the Bible are stories of deliverance. It's the ongoing theme of Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that life is easy. It doesn't mean that God rescues us out of every single bad situation that we experience. And James expresses it well. So I use this as my introduction, James chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Hard words to hear, but those of us who've lived a few years know that they're true words. James 1, 2, and 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, and this is key, mature and complete, not lacking anything. We all know, in spite of the fact that we try everything we can to avoid problems, we know that it's when we go through hardships that we grow, that we mature, that we become more complete. So yes, the journey may be hard, but let's learn the lessons along the way. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that there is joy in the journey. In other words, there's joy even in the midst of the difficulties. And so the challenge this morning is for us to stop listening to negative voices. I'm going to use the book of Exodus. I'm going to be covering seven chapters, well, chapter 7 through 16. So if you want to have your Bible open to that, that's fine. I'm going to, I'm going to go somewhat chronologically, but I'm not going to go verse by verse. So if you're interested in, in following it a little bit, I will be eventually starting at, verse, at chapter 7 of Exodus. But just to give a little background, I'm sure you know most of this background, but it, it's helpful for us to think about it. This is a story. So consider the whole thing a big story from start to finish. But it covers only a few months. And so I had to think how that relates to what we're going through. When we look back on this 10 years from now, we might be able to say, well, you know what? That wasn't as long as I thought it was going to be. Or it wasn't, it wasn't as long as it felt like it during the time. This is one of the most historic eras of, of miracles in all of human history. The God of Israel was referred to as, you all know the name, Yahweh. And that came from the name, I am who I am. And that's the same God that we call Father. And so we have a lot in common with the nation of Israel and what they experienced. So what we have at the beginning of the story is Israel in the nation of Egypt. How did they get there? Well, there was a drought in the land, and it just so happened, one of God's miracles was that he had placed Joseph, an Israelite, in Egypt to provide for the drought. But as a result of that, Jacob and his family eventually moved to Egypt. And so that's how you end up with the Israelites in Egypt. And then eventually there was a Pharaoh who didn't like the, the Jewish people that much. And so he put them into slave labor. And that's where we come to in this story. They've been slaves for many years. And this story now is a process of deliverance. So I think as you go through it, as we go through it, I think you can make parallels to our situation today. The story begins after many years of hardship in Egypt. And so I'm going to begin in chapter 7, and I'm going to begin with the first two verses of chapter 7. These are instructions from Moses and Aaron that God gave them. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. It's an interesting little phrase. And your brother Aaron will be your prophet. And here's the key. You are to say everything I command you and to make, command you and your brother Aaron to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of this country. Just that one little phrase, say everything I command you. Words are important. What we say has a lot of power. Are we saying 
God's words when we speak to people around us. God rewards obedience. And so if we are speaking kind words, if we are speaking positive words, if we are speaking encouraging words, those will be words that are rewarded. Then skipping down to verses 5 and 6. And the Egyptians will know I am the Lord, and this is how they will know, when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. And then verse 6 is key. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. I would suggest that we need to be in constant prayer and contact with our Father in heaven so that we know how to talk to people around us. Then verses 8 and 9 of the same chapter. This is a warning. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So the first thing is a miracle that Aaron is to perform in order to demonstrate God's power. The interesting thing is, remember what happened? Pharaoh's magicians were able to do the same thing. It doesn't explain how they did it, but it was enough to convince Pharaoh that, no, this isn't a big deal. My magicians can do the same thing, so I don't really believe in your God. So then we have the ten plagues. Now I'm going to read through these pretty quickly because what I want you to think about is what God was doing in order to bring his people out of Egypt. And this was a long, drawn-out process. Some suggest that it could have been several months that it took for these plagues to take place. Keep in mind, this is God doing everything in his power to get his people out of Egypt. Starting at verse 20, the first plague. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. Key, the the obedience of Moses and Aaron again is key. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish of the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. And if you read on down, it says, but that didn't convince Pharaoh either. He did not care one way or another. In essence, he didn't care that his people were suffering. And so he wasn't ready to let Israel go. Then verses 5 and 6 of chapter 8. The next plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over all the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. I don't know what your imagination is like, how you picture that. And in a lot of these, and I wasn't able to find out for sure which ones, if all of them occurred this way or not, but a lot of these didn't apply to the nation of of Israel, to the Israelites. It didn't affect them. It doesn't say that on every one of the plagues, but it says that on some of them. Then skipping down to 8, verse 17. When Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. Now, I forgot to mention, the first two, the the blood and the frogs, their magicians were able to duplicate. Now we come to a plague they could not duplicate, and they were not able to duplicate any more of the plagues, which is this progressive sense that God is more powerful than the power in the world. Then verse 24 of chapter 8, the fourth plague. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the house of his officials. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by the flies. Now, after this one, if you read down a little bit, you will see that Pharaoh said, okay, you can go away a little bit and you can make sacrifices, but then you need to come back. So it was influencing him, but it wasn't everything. It wasn't what they had asked for. 
Then skip to chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, the fifth plague. The Lord set a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. So you see how he's beginning to show some protection to Israel. And I would assume that the Egyptians begin to see this difference because it's obvious to them. Then chapter 9, verse 10, the sixth plague. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air, and festering boils broke out on the people and animals. And it just says that that didn't faze Pharaoh. He didn't let him go again. Then the seventh plague in verse 25 of chapter 9. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. Well, that one got Pharaoh's attention, and he said, okay, you can go. But then, as we know, he changed his mind. Then chapter 10, verse 12, the eighth plague. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt so that locusts swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. And again, Pharaoh refused to let them go. Then the ninth plague, verses 22 and 23. Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days, yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Now, I would imagine at this point, there's been nine plagues, and you're thinking if you're an Israelite, what is it going to take? This is never going to happen. This is going to be our life forever. We're going to be slaves in Egypt forever. And it doesn't matter what God does. Pharaoh ignores it and doesn't let us go. I, I think that's the natural inclination we have as humans. to When life just keeps going on the way it's so hard, after a while we think, well, this is just the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. Chapter 11, verses 4 and 5, the 10th plague. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Finally, this was the last straw for Pharaoh. He told the Israelites, get out of here. I don't want any more of these problems. He had seen enough. And he didn't want any more horror to fall on his people. He finally had pity for his own people at this point. And then we have the story in there that Roland read. I'm not going to reread it. And we know that the people passed safely over the Red Sea, even though the Egyptians came after them. Pharaoh changed his mind, but he changed it too late. And so the Egyptians came after him, and many of them drowned in the Red Sea. So now we see that God has provided for his people and he's brought them out of Egypt safely. And now they are, in quotes, wandering. So chapter 14, verses 13 to 14. This is after they've been out for a little while. And they've been complaining and they are afraid of a variety of different things. And here are the words Moses answered the people. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I'm sorry, that was just before the red, crossing of the Red Sea. I have this out of order, my mistake. The point that is made here is that you do not have to be afraid of the things that are coming around you. Even though you see them in your rearview mirror, even though you maybe see them in front of you or to the side of you, do not be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I think it's so important to understand that little phrase, the Lord will fight for you. Then we have, I'm sorry, now we have after they've crossed the Red Sea, skipping down to chapter 16. And this would be several months after they've crossed the Red Sea. And even though wonderful, amazing, miraculous things have happened, they've seen them happen, they're not completely convinced 
that God is on their side. So verses 9 and 10 of Exodus 16. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Hebrew word there is Shekinah, the glory of the Lord. I can't even imagine what that must have looked like to see God's glory as they looked to the sky. Then verses 11 to 28, I'm going to read continuously. It demonstrates how God provides. And you're familiar with the story of manna, but it's a powerful story. And it demonstrates so much of God's provisions and God's detail. I love the detail in this story. So the Israelites have been grumbling about food and drink and, and about being out here in the wilderness. And I don't know how many of you remember a song by Keith Green that says, we want to go back to Egypt. You know, and that's biblical. They said, well, let's go back to Egypt. At least we had food back there. Chapter 16, starting at verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites, so tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Continuing on, that evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is this? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Just stop and think about that for a moment. Just maybe picture in whatever way is, is helpful for you to picture something that you really need, and it suddenly appears. And the interesting thing is it may not appear in the form that you were requesting. They didn't know what this was. They thought, what in the world? We want food and we've got flakes. What is that? Now pay attention to the details in the following verses. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much some little. And when they measured it by the omer, which I found is about nine cups, the one who gathered much did not have too much. The one who gathered little did not have too little. Each one had gathered just as much as they needed. That word needed is so crucial. We have all these wants in life, but what do we need? God provides our needs and then continuing on, then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of this until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. <laughs> God's strange. He goes, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. God provides, but we have responsibility to follow his laws. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath and a holy Sabbath to the Lord, so bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. Here we acknowledge and know the Sabbath is so important to God that he says, I'm going to give you extra the day before the Sabbath, and it will not spoil as it does other days. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it. But on the seventh day of the Sabbath, there will not be any. That's a clear indication that God is at work. God is providing. God is doing what he's promised to do. And then it's the people's responsibility to obey. Nevertheless, there's always that nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? It's this human nature is to hoard. They're thinking, well, if we're given that extra the day before Sabbath, what if we get some on Sabbath? Now we've got another day's worth. And God chastises them for that. The application comes from a variety of short passages this morning. Because this is such a theme throughout Scripture, you can find it all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And a key thing to remember is that we humans are the pinnacle of God's creation. He cares about us deeply. He's going to deliver us according to our needs. And he wants an ongoing relationship with us. He wants us in touch with him, relating to him, being in contact, intimacy. And so... Philippians 4.9 is a word to us. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. There's no need that we have that God can't provide because of his riches. And then Isaiah 43.1 and 2. Israel, the Lord who created you says, Do not be afraid. I will save you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. When you pass through fire, you will not be burnt. The hard trials that come will not hurt you. And just as I mentioned in my introduction, not only will he not hurt you, he will provide for you. He will make a way out. In closing, the sermon is to remind us problems are part of life. But God's goodness is always available, always there. There is joy in the journey. There can be a way out or a way through. God's provisions are abundant. He provides our needs according to his riches. And many times they're unexpected. They're different than what we think they should be or would be. So the Apostle Paul, I think, states it about as succinctly as anyone. In this verse of Thanksgiving, Romans 7, 25. It's what I want us to leave here with. Instead of leaving and spending a week worrying and upset and concerned, Let's leave with these words on our lips. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you are the God of deliverance. You are the God who loves us, who delights in us, who cares for every single need that we have. So we offer ourselves to you this morning. We lay ourselves at your feet. We choose to obey you and to expect your goodness in our lives. Bring us to that point where we understand that maturity and perseverance are the results of hardship. I pray a blessing on this congregation I just ask, Lord, that you would surround us with your presence and that we would be your witnesses wherever we go this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Now is your time to share um, your prayer concerns, your praise notes. Maybe you have a response to Nelson's message. How is God providing for you? How is God delivering you through these past several months? Anyone have anything they would like to share? This is June Shank. A number of you have been asking how my brother Rich was doing following open heart surgery last week. 
He came through it very well. He's home and recovering at home. He said he was just amazed and awed by all the people who were praying for him and lifting him up. He had such a peace before, before surgery. And he said he would hoped in the operating room there was enough room for all the medical personnel because of all the angels that were going to be there. And so he, he is doing very well. Thank you. Thank you, June. Anyone else? How are you? Okay, I've never really done this before, speaking out here like this. Um, this is the first time I've been here, but I do and would like to say something um, I very much, like all of us, have a lot of faith, always have. I've, I've always looked to, to the Lord for everything. And I can honestly say I've never, ever questioned him about how things were going in my life. My husband just passed away about three weeks ago. He, uh, he had cancer, blood cancer. And um, I know God's going to get me through this because he promised, he promised me. And when my, my husband first found out he had cancer, even before then, he had so much peace. He never, in the whole six years, cried, not once. And I used to say to him, because I would be crying, let it out, cry. And he used to say, um, God's going to take me off the mic. <laughs> the back window that that's where he was going, but he had so much faith and, um, and I do too. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. He was only 66, but we were married over 50 years. We started very young. And uh, I could go on and on and on, but um, I just want to thank God for giving me the strength. I was his main caretaker, and it was a 24-7 job, you know, which is anybody would do for their spouse. Um, but every day, I ask God to give me the strength to be able to pick him up um, for a while, I was able to take him for a ride every morning. And then it got to the point where, you know, he couldn't walk. I was losing strength. But uh, I did pray every morning, give me strength to help him get through this. And, um, and I know he will. And I, and I trust him. And praise God. I, I don't know what else to say. I just wanted to share that with somebody. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Anyone else? Hi. <clears throat> Sandy Bright again. I'd like to ask prayer for uh, Paul's sister, Mary. Um, she was, she had episodes of uh, losing her breath and she couldn't breathe. She did have asthma, and she thought maybe that was it. But uh, they took her to the hospital here. She, they found a mass on her lung. And uh, she's in the hospital now. They did a biopsy. They didn't get the results back yet, but uh, I pray that um, the doctors can take care of it and that she'll be okay. She's, she's, she'll be 70 in uh, October, so she's not, very, not real young, but hopefully uh, God will heal her. And I just want to uh, say to this young lady over here, welcome, welcome, and we hope to see you again. Yeah. And um, God will be with you. Thank you, Annie. Okay. I don't want to overdo my welcome. This is how much, how good, how amazing God is. I told you my husband had blood cancer. 
Well, after the third year of having blood cancer, uh, he got really, really sick. First of all, the chemo just depleted him, so we stopped that. They called us all in a room because they thought he was going to die. And they gave him 10% chance of living. 10%. So they asked us what we wanted to do. And, of course, I said, I'm taking him home. Well, and he lived for four more years or three and a half more years. And through that time, we got him to use a walker. I mean, you never know what he's got planned for us or who he's going to work right. through. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was just amazing. And we had a joke in our family. What is going on with you? I mean, you're not even supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? According to the doctors. And then in March, he was supposed to die again. And, uh, but he didn't, he, he was around for, till the end of June. So, but thank you for welcoming me. And I've seen you before. I know I have somewhere and, um, that's it. And I'm a talker and a hugger. So <laughs> don't be offended or whatever. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Dave Gaiman. I just, just have to say, you know, amen this morning. God is a God of deliverance. And as, a, as Pastor Nelson was, was preaching this morning, um, words to a song came, popped into my head. And I don't know why. I don't think I've heard this song since I was probably a young, young guy up at Spruce Lake summer camp. We used to sing this. It's, it's an Andre Crouch song. And, uh, it's, it's uh, titled Through It All. I just want to read a, a couple of the, of the lyrics to you. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrows. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials come only to make me strong. And part of the lyric down towards the end of the song um, it says, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I'd never know what, what trust, what faith in God could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. I mean, every one of us has problems and, and trials, tribulations. Some are, seem pretty insignificant, you know, compared to what others, what was shared this morning, but whatever we're going through, um, our hope, our trust is in God. And think about that when you're going through something, God is allowing you to go through it to make you strong, you know, and he will be with you. He will deliver you. Thank you, Dave. Is there anything else? Jack, Barb. I think our mic is dying. Nothing. Yeah. 
I didn't catch what you said, Barb, other than you had a song that you were going to share the lyrics to or no, no. Okay. <laughs> you were going to sing a song for us. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. You like the song choices. Okay. Good enough. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> let's let's pray. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day today. Thank you for the many ways that you show your provision, your deliverance to us. Thank you for being rich for with June's brother Rich through his surgery. Thank you for his good recovery so far. Thank you for the visitors that we had this morning. We thank you for, the sh for her sharing the way that God is working in her life, even in spite of some struggles. Lord, I pray that you would continue to lead and guide her. I pray for uh, Paul's sister, Mary. We pray for strength and for healing for her. And for, as she... As the doctors determine what to do, I pray that you would give them wisdom and that you would bring her healing. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one that provides and delivers us. May we always trust in you and know that it's, it's what you do and it doesn't matter who we are that you provide regardless. I ask this in your name. Amen. For Life in the Church, um, there are several announcements. And if you have one, I guess the best thing would be maybe I could ask you to come up here and share it if you do have one. I'm, I have several here. The quilting is on Wednesday from 9 to 3. And then this Saturday, um, we're going to have a work day here in the Grove at taking some trees down. Jim said he's going to be here around 8 o'clock. So I'm assuming that's when we'll get started. Um, this Wednesday night, by men's Bible study, we'll be studying 1 Peter 1, th th verses 13 to 25. That's at 7 o'clock in the gym. And check your mailboxes uh, for uh, other recent information. I will add two more things on our schedule for August 2nd. We are planning to have communion here outside. And also August 9th, we are scheduled to have church in the park over at the Boyer Town Park. Are there any other announcements? Okay, Jim is saying that uh, if you want to come Saturday but don't want to be up here, in the Grove, there are some other jobs uh, that we'll be doing uh, down in the church. Um, so on for Saturday. So. If there is nothing else, I'll ask the worship team to come up for a closing song. We invite you to stand to sing our closing song, Peace Before Us, Peace Behind Us, Peace Under Our Feet. One of the things that I wanted to mention is it, it, it almost seems like the, uh, the theme for this morning is how God delivers us, uh, guides us, uh, and above all, he he watches over us and he gives us peace one of the one of the things that it's difficult to understand is the young lady who just lost her husband uh there's a verse in the bible that says god is close to the brokenhearted and when someone loses a person or even a pet uh their heart is broken. They, they grieve. They have to go through a mourning process. But God is with us. He's even closer to us during 
this time. So what he is trying to do, the gift that he is trying to give us is peace. This next song is called Peace Before Us. And that's what I want you to remember uh, as you go through your week, as you go through your months, is that God will give you peace if you allow him. So this next song is, is Peace Before Us. We want to welcome you to our church. We hope you become a part of our family. Know that you are loved and that God is with you. Before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet, peace within us, peace over us, and all around us be peace. Love before us, love behind us, love. Under our feet, love within us, love over us, let all around us be love. Light before us, light behind us, light under our feet. Light within us, light over us, let all around us be light. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ under our feet. Christ within us, Christ over us, let all around us be Christ. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet, peace within us, peace over us, let all around us be peace. Receive this word from the Lord. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. You may go in peace. Mm -hmm.